Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is our last uh, stretch for this class. So we have three hours today. I don't know why on the calendar I had three more hours between 4 and 7 p.m. for us, which is impossible because it will be 10 p.m. for you. So that was a leftover. But uh, this, this afternoon will be the last three hours. And so, uh, as I told you, uh, my former PhD student Camilo Riagno is now Dr. Riagno and working as a postdoc on, uh, uh, on you know, an Air Force project and also leading the uh, development of the D3 CubeSat. Uh, has agreed, kindly agreed, to uh, show you some of his work um, on combining the torques that we have seen, the gravity gradient one and aerodynamics, some of those that we have seen, using the D3 uh, CubeSat with the deployable surfaces to, to control orientation uh, of the satellite on, on three axes. Uh, so before I give him the floor, uh, Camilo is originally from Colombia, where he got two master's degree, degrees. And, uh, and joined uh, uh, the University of Florida a little over three years ago, where he got his master in his PhD uh, in mechanical engineering. And uh, so, yeah, I think I gave you all the information about him. Uh, the paper that uh, goes with this presentation is in the folder with today's date and also the slides. And with that, Camilo, uh, very informally, uh, you know, just explain your work. And uh, if, if you guys have questions, I think they can probably interrupt you and ask, um, but yes, the floor is yours. Feel free to share. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, let, let, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. OK, so uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, can, can, you uh, make, nice. can you make the, the yeah, sure, sure. mode, maybe? Yeah. All right. So yeah, as you said, thank you for the introduction, and uh, it's nice to to be talking to you today. Uh, uh, I I have been, as Dr. Bevilacqua said, I am part of the Advanced Autonomous Multiple Spacecraft Laboratory, ADAMUS, here at the University of Florida, where I have uh, worked mostly on uh, both orbital and attitude control using environmental forces and torques. And uh, this talk today is mostly about the environmental torques for attitude control uh, using uh, uh, the drag maneuvering device, which was uh, designed here at the Adams lab. OK, so the outline of the presentation is uh, as we have here. Uh, first of all, I will present some uh, brief motivation for the problem. Uh, we will go over some uh, uh, concepts of uh, aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque. Then I will present the drag maneuvering device, which, uh, as I said, is, uh, it was developed here at the Adamus lab. And uh, finally, I will present uh, two different uh, approaches for uh, attitude stabilization and control uh, using the drag maneuvering device to combine both aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque. Um, uh, finally, some conclusion for uh, this presentation. So let's just start with the motivation. So uh, the uh, increasing popularity of the small satellites serves as the main motivation for uh, these type of uh, techniques. Uh, it's mainly because uh, they uh, have been uh, uh, used uh, uh, like in, in a standardized way using the CubeSat standard and it has reduced the cost. And uh, we also nowadays have access to a high performance hardware with, with a reduced size that allows as to accommodate uh, uh, like uh, uh, enough power uh, for processing uh, controllers or anything like that on small platforms. Uh, some limitations for these type of platforms are, of course, the reduced volume to accommodate the propellant, which is, uh, of course, a problem if we want a, or if we attempt to control the attitude of the spacecraft with, uh, for example, thrusters. And uh, some of them, uh, especially CubeSats, are launched as secondary payloads for larger missions. Uh, meaning that they can also have some additional constraints to have a propellant uh, uh, due to secure, uh, safety constraints. Um, uh, also, the commercial attitude determination and control systems are among the most expensive components for small satellites. Uh, they are uh, usually in the orders of uh, tens of thousands of dollars. 
and uh, that represents also a problem for uh, small platforms, uh, especially uh, in academia where the budgets are uh, limited. Uh, this uh, uh, picture here is uh, uh, showing uh, the, uh, the main perturbations for uh, uh, the attitude of a satellite, a uh, standard satellite. Uh, 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 these perturbations are in different regimes. So the regime we are interested in uh, is the low Earth orbit, which is uh, usually uh, below uh, 700 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers. Um, the two effects that are the most important are the gravity gradient torque and the aerodynamic torques, which are the uh, green line and the blue lines, respectively. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, the aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque have been considered disturbances in the lower orbit. So, actually, this picture is called uh, disturbances uh, for the attitude of a spacecraft. So uh, the controllers that have been developed uh, throughout the years are uh, have been designed to overcome the influence of those perturbations uh, on the spacecraft attitude instead of using them uh, to actually control the spacecraft. So uh, this new approach is motivated by the increase of the small satellite uh, popularity and uh, exploiting the aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque has become an option for controlling the uh, attitude without using uh, any propellant. And that is ma mainly the, the motivation for this. Um, uh, in order to achieve that goal, uh, new uh, spacecraft designs have been proposed uh, also throughout the years uh, to increase the magnitude of uh, gravity gradient torque and aerodynamic torque to, to have like uh, a bigger influence on the, uh, on the attitude of the spacecraft. Uh, this is the way uh, usually the Euler's law uh, uh, is uh, seen for control purposes. So we have the time derivative of the angular momentum as seen by the inertia frame, and here we have the, the external torques which are usually the control torques. And then we have this disturbance uh, vector that contains uh, the attitude, uh, the uh, aerodynamic torque and the gravity gradient torque and uh, some others. Um, but uh, now we are just going to consider that this uh, external torque is uh, zero and we will just use the uh, disturbances for controlling the spacecraft. Uh, so first of all, I will need to introduce the aerodynamic torque. So as you uh, probably know, the aerodynamic is the largest non-gravitational force uh, acting on, on a satellite uh, in the lower orbit. Uh, in, it also depends on several parameters, and some of them are very difficult to model, uh, such as, for example, the atmospheric density, uh, which we call uh, rho, or the drag coefficient, which represents the interaction of the surfaces of a spacecraft with the atmosphere. Uh, which we call uh, drag coefficient or CD. Uh, so the drag and lift coefficient, uh, the, the drag and lift forces uh, are uh, expressed by uh, these equations. So uh, the, the drag force is the, the one that has the, the biggest or the largest influence on the uh, uh, among the two the two uh, different um, aerodynamic forces, uh, and it, it is mainly because this uh, drag coefficient is uh, has some orders of magnitude uh, is uh, larger than the um, lift coefficient. Uh, it also depends, as I said, on the atmospheric density. Here, S is the uh, surface area. So in this case, the drag and the lift forces are expressed for the J uh, surface of the spacecraft. So we can uh, discretize the spacecraft in different surfaces and compute these. Uh, so uh, we can change the uh, surface area uh, uh, by, by, for example, deploying uh, panels that interact with the atmosphere uh, in such a way that we can modify the magnitude of the forces. And then we can, uh, of course, compute the, compute the aerodynamic torques due to drag and lift by using uh, just uh, this cross product between the vector that goes from the center of mass to the center of pressure and just uh, apply that as, as, uh, uh, as many times as we have uh, surfaces on the spacecraft. Uh, the uh, velocity vector relative to the atmosphere, uh, so uh, you, you, you see here in the uh, drag and lift forces expression, we have this vector VR, which represents the relative velocity of the spacecraft with respect to the atmosphere. And uh, we have to take into account how the atmosphere rotates uh, or moves with respect to the spacecraft. So this is the most common expression that we can use for um, for that uh, relative velocity, 
and it assumes that the atmosphere is co-rotating with the Earth. So uh, this angular velocity, just the Earth's angular velocity, and RC is the, the uh, position of the vector. So here we have the uh, velocity vector of the spacecraft, and here we have the influence of uh, the rotation of the Earth. Uh, this is an example of uh, a design of a spacecraft uh, that uh, tries to use uh, the aerodynamic forces to um, modulate the uh, or to uh, regulate the attitude of the spacecraft. Uh, this is from this paper by Sun. Uh, it has a main hub, uh, which is just the body of the spacecraft, and six drag uh, surfaces, which, which has a uh, each of them has uh, two degrees of freedom, so they can be extended, retracted, and they can also rotate about the longitudinal axis. So by modifying uh, both the angles and the size of those uh, uh, big surfaces, uh, they can generate uh, torques uh, with respect to the, to the um, center of mass uh, so that they can uh, modify uh, their attitude. Uh, regarding the atmospheric density models, there are several with different um, uh, levels of accuracy. The simplest one is the exponential model, which is just uh, taking into account the fact that the density decreases as the altitude increases. So it is embedded in this exponential function where uh, the uh, rho naught and h naught are tunable parameters which are available in lookup tables, which were calibrated uh, based on observations. Um, and uh, more detailed models can also account for chemical constituents, temperature, radiation from the sun, geomagnetic storms, and so on. Uh, uh, there are some purely theoretical models, such as, for example, the Harris Priester, and there are also some uh, uh, which we call uh, semi-empirical models that also include um, uh, measurements taken by uh, satellites by, uh, that actually flew uh, on the lower orbit. Uh, and those were used to uh, calibrate some parameters that are uh, using the model that actually uh, estimates the atmospheric density. So uh, even the most detailed models, uh, such as the NRLMCs or the JAKIA, require forecasting some indices for the real-time onboard operations. So you can imagine that you have some spacecraft which uh, uh, computes some control law on board. It needs to uh, compute the estimate of the atmospheric density at any time uh, so that it can compute uh, the aerodynamic torque that it's uh, applying. Uh, so in that case, uh, forecasting of those indices would be required. And forecasting means that we are introducing some estimation error, uh, which is also a problem for these uh, kind of techniques. On the gravity gradient torque side, so uh, the gravity gradient torque is produced by the gradient of gravitational forces along the spacecraft body. This is the general expression for the gravity gradient torque, where G is the universal gravitational constant, M is the mass of the Earth, uh, RC, as I just said, is the position of the spacecraft, and J is the inertia matrix. So as you can see in the expression, it, the gravity gradient torque mostly depends on the orbit state. Uh, but uh, with by modifying J, we could uh, actually change uh, the, the, the gravity gradient torque, and that is actually what people do uh, when trying to use uh, this effect for uh, controlling or stabilizing the attitude of the spacecraft. So uh, in general, the gravity gradient torque is smaller than uh, the aerodynamic torque uh, in the lower orbit. Uh, but it has some nice stability properties that can be actually exploited to be combined to aerodynamic torque and actually achieve uh, three-axis attitude stabilization. Uh, in this case, uh, this is just an example of uh, a gravity gradient torque application. So this is the SpriteSat microsatellites from the Tokohu University, where they have uh, this, um, uh, the, the main body of the spacecraft, once it was deployed, uh, it deploys a long boom with a tip mass and that uh, produce a, a clear minimum uh, moment of inertia about the vertical axis. Uh, and uh, uh, it uses uh, some uh, um, gravity gradient stability conditions to ensure that the uh, uh, spacecraft remains in the vicinity of uh, nadir pointing. Uh, so uh, to study the uh, uh, gravity gradient stability, uh, we will need to make some uh, assumptions. Uh, 
uh, which will uh, help us uh, coming up with the, with the model that I will show you uh, later in the presentation. So first of all, the goal on, uh, uh, on the space applications uh, regarding the attitude is uh, to have some uh, orientation with respect to the orbital frame usually. Uh, and uh, the assumption that we will make here is that the spacecraft is in a, a circular low Earth orbit, which means that the angular velocity is uh, constant. Uh, that also there are just small departures from the equilibrium point, which is alignment between the uh, body frame and the orbital frame, so just like small angles with respect to that uh, orbital frame. And also that the inertia matrix is constant when expressed in the body frame, uh, which is also a common assumption for expressing the Euler's law. Uh, these are the three uh, main uh, uh, reference frames and the attached coordinate system. So we have the inertia frame with a center uh, with origin at the Earth's uh, center of mass, denoted by the basis X, Y, and C. For the orbital sy coordinate system, we have the, the blue one uh, with origin at the spacecraft center of mass and the basis O1, O2, and O3. And the body coordinate system, which is the one that actually uh, rotates with the spacecraft with origin at the spacecraft center of mass uh, and uh, denoted by the basis V1, V2, and V3. So when we compute the equations of motion, we need to have an expression for the angular momentum, which uh, is commonly expressed as the product between the inertia matrix and the angular velocity with respect to inertia frame. And uh, once we take the time derivative for uh, the Euler's law, uh, under the assumption that the uh, um, uh, inertia matrix is uh, constant, then we, we uh, can obtain this expression by just applying the transport theorem. Um, this is the equation of motion we get, uh, where the only uh, torque that is influencing those dynamics uh, uh, is the gravity gradient torque, because we just want to observe what the influence of this torque on the attitude dynamic is. And then for visualization purposes, um, we will represent the orientation of the spacecraft using a 3 to 1 Euler angle sequence with respect to the orbital frame uh, with uh, um, phi, theta, and psi being a rod pitching yaw. Uh, so here we can express the um, angular velocity of the spacecraft with respect to the inertial frame as just uh, the addition of these two terms, where uh, this first one is the angular velocity of the body with respect to the orbit, and this one is the angular velocity of the orbit with respect to the inertial frame. So in the second term, we know that it is just driven by the uh, angular velocity of the orbit uh, about the uh, axis, the orbit axis O2. And uh, we can apply the 3 to 1 Euler angle kinematics to uh, compute the angular velocity of the body with respect to the uh, orbital frame uh, as a function of the angular rates. Then uh, we can uh, take the time derivative uh, for uh, these expressions and also apply the angle approximation, and this is what we will get. So we get the angular velocity uh, under the small angle approximation here as a function of the roll pitch in your rates and also the uh, orbit angular velocity. And then we can take the time derivative and obtain uh, omega dot. We can do the same for uh, the gravity gradient torque. We can just uh, take the direction cosine matrix and apply that for the position vector and express everything on the um, uh, body reference frame. And this is the expression we get after applying the uh, small angle approximation. Uh, the linearized equation of motion then is uh, this uh, set of three equations that we have here, where the first one is for the roll dynamics, then the pitch dynamics, and then the yaw dynamics. So as uh, you can see here, the pitch dynamics are decoupled from the other, uh, from the other two. Uh, we don't have a influence of roll or yaw in this uh, second equation. So we can study the stability of these uh, single equations separately from the other two. Uh, so essentially, we just need to make this coefficient to be uh, a greater than zero, and then the system will be stable. And that is exactly what this uh, um, condition is uh, saying. Uh, and then we can uh, compute these uh, uh, modified variables, which are k1 and k3, and they are just uh, these ratios of inertia. Uh, and uh, this is the way they are usually shown in a, in a plane of uh, k1 and k3 uh, and then we will start coloring some areas 
that will show uh, where the spacecraft is stable and when it is unstable. So the shaded region um, or the green region is the one that is um, uh, unstable and the, the white region is the one that where, where the spacecraft is stable. So the, the, if this is a stable, so if we are in the white region, the, the, the system, the pitch uh, dynamics will have two imaginary eigenvalues, which means that the spacecraft will oscillate around zero and that there will be no, no damping. Uh, Essentially, we, we don't have like a theta dot here uh, to provide the dumping, so uh, it will it will be oscillate in the vicinity of um, uh, alignment on the pitch axis with respect to the orbital frame. And then uh, the role in yaw dynamics are coupled with each other. So here you can see the influence of the yaw on the roll dynamics and the influence of the uh, role on the yaw dynamics. And uh, we can express these as a state space uh, representation and obtain the characteristic equation, which is uh, what we have here. Uh, this characteristic equation is a fourth order equation, but as you can see, it has only s to the fourth, s to the second, and then s to the zero. Uh, so we can solve for s to the second and then take the square root and uh, obtain uh, these uh, two different um, uh, these two different uh, conditions, uh, which uh, say uh, that this, uh, as if we satisfy these equations, then uh, the spacecraft will be stable. Uh, so the uh, white regions then are the only uh, regions where the spacecraft will be uh, stable for, bo for both the roll yaw couple dynamics and also the pitch dynamics. So if we look into these uh, uh, white regions, uh, the big one here, the, the whole triangle, uh, would mean that uh, J2 is greater than J1 and greater than J3, meaning that the spacecraft will travel in this configuration where the uh, skinnier uh, uh, axis is the one that is uh, uh, aligned with the vertical um, with the vertical axis uh, of the orbit. And then um, this uh, second one is uh, this whole triangle means that J1 is greater than J2 and greater than J, J3 and greater than J2. Uh, so, so if we take into account all the triangle, that would be the condition. But since uh, we have only just a portion here, then just a subset of those, uh, of, uh, of this condition will be uh, uh, the one that provides a stability. Uh, given that this is very difficult to warranty, uh, essentially that we are inside that specific subset, then usually this is what uh, people use for um, uh, for stabilizing the spacecraft by gravity gradient torque, and that's what we just saw on the uh, uh, sprite sat uh, example uh, previously, where the boom was along the vertical axis, so that it was skinnier along that axis, and the minimum moment of inertia was about uh, that axis. And then uh, this is the drag maneuvering device. Uh, uh, or we previously called it uh, the D3 or drag the orbit device. Uh, we just decided to uh, change the uh, the name because we are now using it to maneuver not only uh, uh, the the orbit of the spacecraft to change the orbit of the spacecraft, but also to modify the orientation. We are, so we are just uh, act actively maneuvering the spacecraft. Uh, so the drag maneuvering device is uh, uh, it can be attached to uh, standard cubesats. And it has uh, four drag surfaces in a uh, dark configuration, uh, which provides uh, uh, stability about um, about uh, yaw and uh, pitch uh, by just uh, by just having this inclination and putting the center of pressure behind the center of mass. Uh, so it, uh, those um, surfaces are uh, offset 90 degrees with respect, with respect to each other, and they also have a 20 degrees inclination. Uh, they are each one is uh, three point, up to 3.7 meters uh, long, and they could uh, provide another cross-sectional area of uh, uh, 0.5 meters squared. Uh, the weight of the uh, of all the booms together is about 0.5 kilograms. So when it is attached to CubeSat, for example, a two-u CubeSat, which is uh, around three kilograms, uh, it, it could significantly affect also the inertia matrix. And uh, that's something that we wanted also to exploit uh, for um, modifying the 
or, or to controlling the attitude of the spacecraft. So how can how can we change the uh, uh, aerodynamic torque that, uh, by using the drag maneuvering device. So we will keep the same assumption of the small angles for now. Um, and uh, let's consider the drag force. So this product between uh, WB and LJ, where J is just like the J surface. So here we, here we have uh, four uh, surfaces. Uh, this is uh, the uh, area of the surface, where WB is the surface's width. Uh, which is constant, but we can change the length uh, as uh, uh, to, to, to have this, the specific value that we want. So by changing that, we can modify uh, the amplitude of the drag force and uh, uh, use that for modifying the aerodynamic torque. Uh, the vector RJ then uh, is uh, just the addition of these two vectors where RC is the vector that goes from the center of mass to the uh, center to the geometric center of the uh, rear face of the spacecraft and then uh, the vector rj's uh, that goes from that point to the actual center of pressure um, so as i just said the uh, the the dmd surfaces are in a dark configuration which uh, allows um, um aerodynamic uh, aerodynamic uh, passive stabilization about the second and the third axis so you can imagine that you can have an unbalanced uh, here, uh, uh, so, so you, you, you can have, uh, if you have them uh, equally deployed, uh, they, these, the torques applied by uh, uh, the surface L1 and the surface L2, they will cancel each other when those, uh, when the frame, the body frame and the orbital frame are aligned. And the same will happen with uh, L2 and L4, uh, modifying the torque about the B3 uh, axis. Uh, and then how can we change the gravity gradient torque by modifying the uh, surfaces uh, of the DMD? Uh, so first of all, we will need to model the, the how, how the inertia matrix changes uh, with respect to the uh, surfaces length. So we discretized the, um, the, the D3 in uh, several subsystems or sub bodies. Uh, the CubeSat body will be a rectangular box. Uh, the roll portion of the uh, boom is a thick walled cylinder, which uh, we know the moments of inertia for those uh, shapes. And uh, the outer uh, diameter, which is R2, will be a function of the uh, length of the boom. Uh, so so we, can, we can have expressions for the moments of inertia as a function of L. And the same for the uh, deployed portion, uh, it will be a flat plate. And one of these dimensions would be uh, would be the length, so that the moments of inertia are also a function of L. So we can first uh, find all the inertia matrix uh, for for each specific shape individually, and then we can apply just rotation of the inertia matrix to have them align with the uh, principal axis of inertia, and then we can apply parallel axis theorem to uh, bring those uh, to the uh, center of mass and then add them all together. Uh, so that we can have the entire inertia matrix as a function of the length. So we did some small simulations for uh, proving this uh, approach. Uh, the goal is to combine aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque for uh, uh, attitude stabilization. So we are uh, we we are trying to uh, achieve. Uh, a, pitch and yaw stabilization by uh, using uh, the aerodynamic torque, essentially just keeping the uh, vertical uh, the vertical surfaces, which are L1 and L3, at the same level. And the horizontal surfaces are at the same level, uh, which are L2 and L4. So we have L1 and L3 uh, equal to 3 meters, and L2 and L4 equal to 1.5 meters. So as you can see here, the vertical ones are much longer than the horizontal ones, which uh, provides a clear minimum axis a moment of inertia about the vertical axis, which is exactly what we want to uh, uh, satisfy this uh, gravity gradient stability condition. So here in this simulation, I have uh, the, the examples with uh, applying by uh, satisfying the gravity gradient stability condition uh, and uh, well, not satisfying it and then satisfying it so if we don't satisfy that, here we can see the pitch and the yaw 
uh, stabilization by uh, aerodynamic torque, but the spacecraft will still uh, be spinning about the first uh, body axis, which means that uh, the roll um, the roll uh, angle is uh, diverging. And then if we satisfy this condition, which is just putting all these uh, surfaces at the same uh, at these levels, then the gravity gradient torque will help us uh, keeping the roll angle also bounded, uh, which is the goal for the uh, attitude stabilization. So up to this point, we have seen uh, that uh, the, the aerodynamic torque and the gravity gradient torque can be combined for achieving uh, attitude stabilization. But uh, we have, as you have seen, we have made uh, several assumptions and uh, they might be uh, too restricted for a real operation scenario. So there are some problems. Uh, the first one is that we are assuming that we completely know uh, and we can precisely achieve the, the, uh, the length of all the uh, surfaces to be uh, at, the, at the place, uh, at, the, at the levels of deployments that we want. Uh, but it is not uh, usually the case because there are construction tolerances and uh, it may produce some residual aerodynamic torque that could drive this uh, CubeSat uh, to be beyond the limits for the small angle approximation and then all the stability that we have studied will not be warranted uh, using this approach that we just presented. Then uh, we can also have a mission that requires not only stabilizing, meaning that keeping all the angles bounded as we, uh, as we have seen, but actually regulating them and bringing bring them as uh, close to zero as possible, or, or just having the spacecraft uh, with a specific configuration of orientation uh, different from alignment with respect to the orbital frame. Uh, so in that in those cases, this approach of attitude stabilization by just using uh, the, the the techniques that we have uh, that we have shown uh, will be insufficient, and uh, we have also assumed that we know perfectly the atmospheric density and other parameters which uh, might not be uh, useful if we want to achieve a more complicated control objectives. So there are some considerations that we can make to address this problem. Uh, the first one is that we can avoid using the Euler angles uh, because there are singularities that could uh, show up when controlling for large angles, uh, which could be the case in a real operation uh, scenario. Uh, we should use definitely the full coupled nonlinear dynamics without linearizing it uh, so that we can take into account all, all the uh, coupling between, between the three angles. Or the, the yeah the, the yeah the three angles if, if you want to look at uh, at that um, we can also dynamically change the length of the uh, of the DMD not just keeping them fixed but actually change them dynamically following some control law uh, to help uh, dumping those residual oscillations and achieving better uh, pointing results. And uh, we can also incorporate adaptation capability to compensate for uncertainties, uh, for example, in the atmospheric density and some other parameters. So um, this is how the Euler's law would look like in, in, in the case that I just described following the considerations. Uh, the first one is that we have an additional term, uh, which is uh, the J dot. And this, this is just because uh, uh, if we change actively the length of the drag surfaces, then uh, the inertia matrix will also change, even if we ex if we express that in the body reference frame. So uh, if we take the time derivative of the angular momentum, then this uh, additional term will appear. Um, and then we have uh, same uh, two terms here for the rest of the dynamics and then the aerodynamic torque and gravity gradient torque. Uh, on the drag and lift forces, we will uh, have some uncertain quantities, which are uh, usually uh, the most important ones, the atmospheric density and the drag and lift coefficients. So we don't know uh, exactly uh, their values and we need to compensate for that uh, uncertainty. Then we can uh, express the orientation of the spacecraft uh, with uh, the uh, quaternion. So this quaternion is a representation of the space, the orientation of the spacecraft with respect to the um, to the inertial frame. It has uh, a scalar and the vector part. Uh, it has to have a, um, a unit norm, 
And this is the quaternion kinematics, which is just the equation that, uh, that uh, relates the uh, quaternion rates with the angular velocity of the spacecraft. And it is also a function of the quaternion itself. Uh, so if we look uh, in more detail into the dynamics, uh, all the circle terms are the terms that we can actually modify by uh, changing the length. So we can change the inertia matrix, its time derivative, and we can also change both the aerodynamic and the gravity gradient torques. So it looks like we can affect a lot of terms, meaning that uh, we have a reasonable control authority over the system, but the control inputs are all over the place and we have to come up with a controller that actually takes that into account and uh, help us uh, taking, taking the most from, uh, from the uh, use of the DMD device. So uh, this, uh, this is just the error quaternion, and it is, it, it is useful in cases where we want to not only achieve alignment uh, with, uh, with respect to the, uh, to the orbital frame, but also that we would do one, for example, to track some reference, or we have to have a, we want to have like a specific orientation with respect to the orbital frame. Uh, so the error quaternion, it's just uh, uh, this expression, which is function of uh, the, the Q, uh, which is the actual quaternion, and the QD, which is just the desired quaternion. And that it's uh, just uh, some input, reference input that we can provide to the system. Uh, it also has to, uh, comply this uh, unit norm condition. And the uh, error quaternion kinematics look very similar to what we uh, previously saw for the quaternion. The difference is that it is a, um, a function of the uh, error quaternion components and also this omega tilde, which is uh, the relative angular velocity defined by this expression, where uh, we have uh, the actual omega of the body and this the omega d uh, which is the desired angular velocity, which is also provided as a reference to the system. And R tilde is just a rotation matrix that um, brings this vector omega d to the same reference frame as uh, omega. Uh, uh, then we can uh, start defining some uh, useful variables. So this is just what we call an error signal. So it, it has uh, uh, information about the error on the quaternion, but also the error on the angular velocity, because uh, the EV dot, as we have seen in the error quaternion kinematics, is a function of omega. <clears throat> and then if we take the time derivative of uh, this vector r, uh, this is the expression that we will get, where omega, where uh, y theta, it's uh, this uh, complicated expression, but this is just uh, an expansion of uh, the attitude dynamics. So uh, if you take the time derivative of EV, then you will have some expression of uh, omega dot. And uh, from the dynamics, we have omega dot here. So essentially, we can just solve for omega dot uh, on this uh, uh, Euler's law. And then we can plug in omega dot uh, into this uh, time derivative. And this, uh, this is part of the expression that we will get. Um, we are calling it uh, a y theta, and uh, it is just uh, two terms because uh, it's a linear parameterization with respect to the uncertain parameters, where which in this case are all in the vector uh, theta. So theta contains, for example, drag coefficient, which we don't know, uh, atmospheric density, and we could also include uh, the lift if we wanted to. Um, the Y is the uh, measurable regression matrix. So it's just uh, the matrix that makes uh, this product equal to this uh, equation, including the dynamics. And it contains only measurable quantities and uh, things that we can compute, such as, for example, the inertia matrix or the um, uh, error quaternion or the uh, angular velocities, which are uh, assumed to be measurable. Then we can start uh, developing our actual controller to modify uh, the attitude of the spacecraft. So uh, this is the what we call the auxiliary controller. It's just a vector that contains all the parameters that we can manipulate. So we can manipulate essentially the, the four lengths of the booms, which are all embedded in the vector, uh, in the matrix Y, as you can see here. So if theta is just this expression, then all the j's, which are function of uh, length, 
and also the remaining of the uh, uh, aerodynamic torque will be uh, a function of the length, uh, which is exactly what we have here. So um, this is a vector that we can manipulate, the, the matrix that we can manipulate, and this uh, vector theta hat is just an estimate of theta because we don't know theta uh, precisely. And then we can we can design a control law by uh, by just uh, using uh, standard uh, Lyapunov theory. And now we show the proof, the, the, uh, an overview of the proof later on the, on the presentation. But uh, the main idea is that here we have a feedback term uh, of uh, R, which is the the modified state that contains uh, E dot and also E uh, the error uh, quaternion. Uh, it also has the uh, time derivative of the error quaternion. The vector portion of the error quaternion and the error quaternion itself, and um, k alpha and beta are just constant control gains that we can tune uh, depending on the control uh, authority that we have on the system. So the goal is uh, this is what we desire. Uh, so this is this is the torque that we need to apply to the system so that you, we can make it stable. And then we have to reproduce that torque by modifying this uh, product. Uh, between y and theta hat. So we have to do two different things. We have to compute um, some estimate of theta by uh, designing a, an update law. Uh, and uh, that's uh, I, I will show that later uh, in this uh, slide. And then we can modify the length to make this product to be as close as possible to UD. So uh, we can define the estimation error, which is just uh, the difference between the actual uncertain parameters, which we don't know, and our estimate of the uh, uncertain parameters, uh, and we call that theta tilde. And then we can plug in the control law, which is the expression we have here, and uh, this is the expression that we will get. So here we 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 have the what we call the uh, closed loop error system, which contains the um, effect of the controller and also uh, the uh, the dynamics of the system. And then this uh, last term is just uh, a the is just to to uh, include the possibility of having some uh, small mismatch between the U bar and U D bar, uh, just because for example we could have some uh, construction limitation or we could we could have a saturation on, on the actuators. So to account uh, for those uh, differences, we have defined this vector chi. Uh, and the way we design this uh, theta hat, it's by designing the, its, uh, um, its uh, rate of change, which is theta hat dot. And uh, it's uh, used, we can integrate this expression to obtain a theta hat and plug this in at any point in time so that we can compute U bar uh, in real time. Uh, so uh, this is the expression we have uh, here. Uh, gamma is just the uh, adaptation gain, which is uh, a constant that we can manipulate to determine how fast we want to um, uh, change our estimation. Uh, the Y uh, is the regression matrix, which, as I said, it's uh, measurable, so we can have this quantity computed at any point in time. And the R vector is uh, just a vector of the states that we assume that we can measure. So uh, if we design that control law, which we called uh, UD bar, and uh, also the adaptation law, which is uh, theta hat dot, then we can show uh, by using a Lyapunov stability analysis that uh, the attitude error converges to the vicinity of zero, meaning that we can achieve uh, uh, bounded uh, tracking with respect to the reference that we apply to the system. Uh, so this is an overview of the proof. Uh, we just uh, uh, propose a candidate Lyapunov function, which we call V. Uh, this is an scalar function uh, that, is, that contains information about all the states of the system. So we have R and EV. So here we have angular velocities. Here we have the orientation of the system. And it also contains information about the estimation error uh, which is uh, theta tilde. And then we have, uh, we can uh, express everything in terms of this composite uh, error vector, which is, which contains information about R and EV. Uh, so as you can see here, R, uh, all, all these uh, uh, terms are uh, quadratic terms, uh, meaning that uh, this function V is positive definite. 
So if we have a positive definite scalar function and we take the time derivative of that uh, function, and it turns out that the uh, time derivative is uh, negative definite or, com or satisfies some conditions, then we can show that the, all these states that are inside V also converge to zero. So if, you, if we uh, take the time derivative and substitute the closed loop open loop error system, which is essentially R dot, uh, this is the expression we get. So here we have a quadratic term uh, with uh, this K matrix, which is a control gain that we can define to be a positive definite. So this will be negative definite in terms of R. And uh, this other term has a similar form uh, uh, which is a negative definite term in terms of uh, the vector portion of the other quaternion. And then we have this residual term, which is just uh, uh, upper bounded by a constant, and we have to take that into account on the final result. Then we can invoke the comparison lemma to get the, um, the solution for these uh, differential equations. So here we have the um, uh, behavior of uh, the Lyapunov function over time. It's just an exponential expression of some um, negative coefficient of t. So this converges to zero and uh, starts from the uh, initial conditions. And here we have just a, a residual term, which uh, uh, comes from from this uh, uh, from this uh, residual chi. Uh, then we can start uh, changing from v uh, back to y and then back to R and EV. So that's what we have said uh, here. This uh, uh, Y being part of uh, L infinity means that this is bounded, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, something that we, can, that we need to prove in order to, um, to, uh, to show the, that the system is stable. So then we can say that R and EV are bounded, and then all the other signals on the dynamics of the system are also bounded by just looking at the dynamics. Um, so then the result uh, in terms of y is saying that the, the norm of y is uh, smaller than uh, this uh, um, expression. So it's upper bounded by this expression, which is a decreasing function. Uh, if uh, b1, b2, and b3 are positive constants, which they are. So um, if, if they all are um, constants and we know the values of the constants, we can say that uh, the, the states inside Y, which are R and EV, they also conver uh, converge to zero. But since we have this uh, uh, ultimate bound, uh, which we cannot, uh, essentially we will be uh, as, close as, as close to zero as B3, as the value of B3. Um, so this is the ultimate bound. And that's why this, the attitude error system converges not exactly to zero, but to some vicinity of zero, depending on how good uh, our estimate of uh, chi or our, our value of chi is. Uh, we we uh, conducted some uh, simulations just to show all, all that theory. Um, so the simulation uh, takes into account a, uh, the physical properties of a 2U CubeSat with a DMD device. Uh, uh, and uh, it also takes into account all the, cube, the, the spacecraft nonlinear attitude dynamics. So the initial orbit for the system is a 400 kilometers uh, uh, altitude orbit, similar to that of the International Space Station. Uh, the physical characteristics of the spacecraft are as shown in this uh, table. And uh, we selected the control gains as we have here. So we have alpha, beta, and, and uh, k uh, as we have uh, as we have here. So they are positive uh, uh, definite uh, matrices, and they are constant. And this is the adaptation gain, uh, which uh, is uh, helpful for um, uh, for estimating the uncertain parameters. Uh, the initial conditions for the regulation objective. So, uh, we, what we call regulation in this case is just uh, bringing the bringing the attitude of the spacecraft to a certain orientation fixed with respect to the orbital frame. So, uh, as you can see here, our uh, roll pitching yaw, and this is just uh, showing this uh, for visualization purposes. All the computations in the controller are made using quaternions, 
but then we are uh, plotting also the um, Euler angle equivalent and the initial conditions uh, just to have them uh, like with more meaningful values for us. So here we have a bigger, uh, large, larger values, so they don't satisfy the small angle approximation, uh, and we are still able to uh, to drive the system to the desired state. Uh, angular velocities, uh, as we have here, and uh, the desired values are 45 degrees uh, on the roll axis and zeros on the pitch in yaw. And uh, here we can see the behavior of the quaternion. So this is what the uh, controller was actually trying to do. We have some reference of the quaternion, which is which are the four dashed, dashed lines uh, being QD. And then we are driving all the solid lines, which are uh, representing the, the the Q uh, to be on top of the QD. And uh, on the uh, Euler angles equivalent, so we have uh, the reference for the uh, roll uh, angle uh, at 45 degrees and the other at zero. And you can see that uh, they are, are converging to, um, to the vicinity of those values. They have some small oscillations about that if you zoom in, but uh, the overall behavior is uh, very good as compared with the, with the previous approach. Uh, the length of the booms, uh, you, you can see how they behave here. So they are independently uh, changing over time. And uh, uh, by doing those uh, changes of uh, deployment levels, uh, they are uh, modifying the torques uh, so that this uh, result is achieved. This uh, second simulation is uh, for a different objective. So uh, in this case, it was a tracking objective with respect to the orbital frame. So we have a time varying reference for the role, uh, and uh, here, here was the result. So uh, same thing, uh, initial uh, large angles and uh, uh, time varying reference for the role. Uh, the behavior of the quaternion, it's uh, similar. It just takes more time because the maneuver is more demanding. Uh, but the behavior on the Euler angles equivalent can be uh, easy. Uh, easily observed here. So uh, it takes about five hours to um, to have all the three angles on top of the references. Uh, here we can see the behavior of the boom length. So they, they require a lot more control effort, uh, uh, but uh, it is still possible to drive the system to the actual uh, references. And uh, finally, some uh, conclusions. Uh, first of all, uh, we have shown that it is possible to combine the environmental torques, uh, such as uh, aerodynamic and gravity gradient, for the purpose of attitude stabilization, and then uh, by using uh, uh, similar techniques as uh, the one as uh, we have shown here, we can actually control uh, the spacecraft uh, attitude in the lower orbit. If we incorporate the capability of active modulation of the surface's length, we can improve the attitude control performance, and that, that opens uh, a lot of opportunities for coming up with different designs and configurations of the surfaces, which can be investigated in the future for improved control authority, instead of just using those uh, four fixed uh, uh, booms. Uh, so it's uh, open for future investigation, and we can we are interested in that uh, uh, for for the near future. Uh, I think with that, I will end this presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. And I will take any questions you may have. Thanks, Camilo. So the, the last uh, maneuvers, uh, they we, uh, remind me, we have, uh, you track LVLH, but on one axis, you're oscillating. That's the desired. Yes. Yeah, I'm just asking because uh, one of uh, the class assignments is to use uh, momentum exchange devices to uh, to just track LVLH without any additional motion, but basically they have to stay with the body axis aligned with uh, LVLH. So. Yes, so it, it would be similar to this uh, regulation maneuver. Uh, the mm -hmm. only difference is that uh, this uh, reference would be on zero, and that means that uh, you are completely aligned with LVLH. Does the audience have any questions for Camilo? Yes, may I ask a question? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the very interesting presentation. 
what I would like to ask if uh, if I have understood well, at, at this stage, we are still considering the uh, spacecraft as uh, um, perfectly rigid, right? Yes. Yes, okay. that's true. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so in reality, uh, as uh, as you are probably um, saying it's, uh, or imagining it, that uh, those long bones will have uh, also uh, flexible dynamics. So we should probably include those uh, into the dynamics and uh, start uh, developing controllers around that. And that's actually something we are working on uh, right now. Um, but yeah, definitely those long bones would mean uh, flexible, uh, flexible dynamics. Uh, okay, no, it was ex exactly this, but I was looking at this plot in which uh, you, uh, I think you, you spend uh, three or uh, four hours to, yes. to reach, let's say, a stable oscillation. And uh, I don't know, in this time frame, can you consider that the uh, angular rate is, uh, is, is still small and, and, and does not affect uh, the, uh, the, the rigid uh, hypo hypothesis or, or not, in your, uh, in your opinion? Uh, yes, we actually wrote a paper about that, and one of the comments uh, from uh, the reviewers was uh, on that uh, on that end. So what we did was just uh, we we computed the um, the flexible modes of the spacecraft uh, by using uh, just a, um, CAD software, and then we just uh, plotted uh, the um, the applied torques to the system and computed the uh, uh, Fourier transform. And then we just compare the frequencies, uh, the range of frequencies of both of them and compare them against the uh, natural frequencies. And we are still below that. And that is uh, essentially because, uh, as you are saying, uh, those man these maneuvers using, a, a tor using these environmental torques require a lot of time to be done. And they are just intended to uh, compensate for small deviations uh, and small angular velocities. And in that case that, that we shown in that paper, we uh, didn't hit uh, the first uh, um, the first uh, mode of, of vibration. We were uh, well below that. Uh, but in some cases, if you are, for example, if you are coming up with uh, uh, different configurations and attempting to do faster uh, maneuvers, then you will need to take into account for sure the flexible dynamics. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much was very, very interesting. Yeah, so uh, the, the paper that Camilo is mentioning is in the folder today's date. And uh, towards the end, you will see there's uh, um, the representation of the first uh, five modes. And uh, and you can find in the paper, yeah, the comments. Uh, and then just below that plot, there is the frequency content of the torque supplied. And so yeah, you can do towards the end this, this analysis uh, which is basically saying we're moving slow enough uh, and we're hopefully not exciting any of those. So yeah, but that's that's a great question. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Um, yes, ju just a curiosity. Um, in the plot, uh, which show the um, variation of the of the length of booms, uh, there is a, um, a time interval in which the the command uh, goes from the minimum and maximum values. For example, the L4 uh, command, and uh, it is feasible uh, uh, with. Uh, to um, change the length of the boom so so fast in uh, in space. Yeah, so that's uh, actually a good question, and, and, and it is also a common question that once we submit these type of uh, uh, papers. Uh, what we usually do is that in implementation, and it is actually included here. We include uh, after computing the length, we uh, apply a low pass filter, which uh, and which helps helps us um, reducing the rate of change of the of those uh, lengths. And uh, given the time frame here, it, it looks like they are uh, very fast, but you have to take into account that, that it takes uh, a lot of uh, some some hours and uh, some minutes to, to do that. And uh, in this case, in this case, it was uh, we computed the, the largest uh, rate of change 
and it was uh, still below the um, uh, what we have uh, feasible for the uh, D3. Uh, it is still demanding in terms of energy, um, but uh, it is feasible mechanically. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, if you uh, if you come up with more questions for Camilo, uh, just let me know and I can uh, pass them along. So thank you, Camilo, for your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, no, we thank can, you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, let you go. And if uh, the class is fine, I would actually like to continue. Um, if that's okay with you, and we'll take a break in, uh, you know, some time. Because we have a three hour slot today, and so we'll definitely take a break, but maybe not now. That's okay. Okay. All right, Camilo, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You. Have a good day, everyone. Thank bye. you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so. Um, this is what I was planning to do. A couple of announcements. I checked with uh, Dr. Grassi and Dr. Capocello, and uh, uh, we agreed that you can take until Friday of next week, the 9th, to turn on your uh, simulating files. And really, I don't, I don't envision, you know, uh, being picky with grading. I just need the homework one and two to run when you send me a package that I can run it without errors and that it plots uh, uh, the results correctly and I can see that you know, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and of course, this is the last day that we meet formally, but um, we can keep uh, emailing each other and also um, meet on Zoom, for example, or even Teams, why not, uh, as needed, okay? Uh, Let's see, the, uh, the other thing is thanks for the seven of you who have responded to uh, the survey here. Again, it's completely anonymous. I can show you what I see. Mm, yeah, this. So, yeah, this is what I see you know, for different questions. I don't know who I responded what. And even if I do uh, go into the specific questions, uh, yeah, I, don't, I can't see. I can't see any names, of course. So, anyways, <clears throat> when I create the let's see the Excel with different questions and the actual values, and of course, it's going to open on the other screen right here. Uh, well, you've been very kind, first of all. I hope you will be honest as well. <laughs> this is very important for me to... Uh, no, this is the first time that I do a class uh, for this uh, program, that I teach a class where the students are abroad, and, and uh, you know, online is not the first time, but you know, this, this kind of format is, is weird for everybody, I think. So everything is, is pretty high. The two areas where maybe I should improve a little bit are, uh, yeah, the expression of expectations. I completely agree. I've been extremely vague in terms of the homeworks. I told you that you have to give me two simulating files and that's the end of the story. Um, and that's because I also, for, a, for PhD students taking classes during their PhD, I do not even believe that grading is required. Uh, you know, at, at this point in your academic career, you, you're, you're learning, you want to learn, you have your thesis to work on. So I just, I was a little too vague and, and that, that can be definitely easily changed in terms of how many points each, is each one and how do you break it down into points. But uh, what, I, what I can tell you now is that you shouldn't worry about it. But yes, that can be absolutely more specific. Uh, and the other one is facilitation of learning. So. I mean, it's, it's still pretty high, but it's, you know, these are the two lowest. And so if you have comments, and not now, I mean, in general, on how we could improve this class, uh, that wasn't a good screen to see, right? 
Oops. Um, please do let me know, okay? Uh, take your time, think about it, send me an email. Uh, it would not be held against you in any way. Uh, but hopefully the next time around will be in person, so some of these things may actually resolve themselves uh, that way. Okay, so questions, comments, concerns? So today... Yes, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I can. Uh, I, uh, as a, probably you know, I use uh, different... Uh, uh, function that comes from uh, the aerospace block set. And uh, I don't know if I have to change all the functions, all the blocks, uh, because if, when I uh, will uh, send you the final file. No, because, uh, well, no, the, we do have a license. It's just that it's not directly on my computer. And actually, when I run MATLAB, I have to VPN into my a university server and it's just that uh, I believe we have a certain number of licenses and in the lab and so if uh, my students are using them or even they just have something open with that block even though they don't run it it counts as a license in use and so that's that's really why it usually doesn't work there's always someone doing something uh, okay. but I think I should be able to run it it's okay, okay it may be not immediate but uh, yeah so thank you thank you and then, uh, so for today, we have a couple more hours left or so. We can press on and look at those slides called Lecture 8. But I think, uh, let's see how the Simulink work goes first. Uh, because we were leaving yesterday and uh, uh, one of you was working on the uh, variable speed quantum moment gyro Simulink model. We removed that uh, uh, algebraic loop. Uh, but still it wasn't integrating, so maybe we can pick up from there. And then uh, another colleague uh, sent me uh, a homework one inclusive of the gravity gradient, which is still not working. So maybe we can uh, dedicate time to those and the theory in lecture eight, which is really beyond the scope of this class anyways, um, which is controlling a one degree of freedom um, a spacecraft with a flexible link and a mass uh, at the tip of that link. It's applying basically the theory that we have seen yesterday. Uh, and the novelty there is uh, in designing what it's called an input shaping controller, uh, which is exactly what you've seen in the videos. So I think this is something that you can, if you're interested, digest by yourself if we don't get to discuss it today. But I would like to leave you uh, you know, possibly in relatively good shape with the assignments. So, shall we continue on the? Um, if you agree with that, otherwise we can we can go to those slides. But I was thinking to continue on the uh, similar it's model. Okay, that we, yeah. So do we have? Uh, yes. Do we um, want to do that? Maybe. Were you able to fix anything or? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. We, uh, yes, we kind of understood uh, what is the problem uh, with the divergence. And now, uh, OK, so it comes from the derivative, from the numerical derivative. So, uh, OK, here it is. Uh, so for the moment, uh, we just commented it in the in the function that computes the MED torque. So <laughs> this is our temporary solution. Uh, so awesome. without this term here, with the gamma double dot that comes out of the, sorry, hmm. of the numerical derivative, uh, it runs. Uh, but uh, just one thing that we were doing wrong was the definition of the error quaternion because we forgot to invert the body quaternion. So we realized that, and uh, um, here it is, the function. Mm -hmm. You mean the, um, yeah, this one. Let me, yes. Let me, let me go back to mine since we have it here because I was also not entirely sure it was identical, but then I just got distracted. And... Go ahead, keep, keep talking. I want to see if mine is. Uh... Okay, yes, because the uh, desired quaternion is the one that goes from the ECI to the um, 
commanded attitude, while uh, the body quaternion still goes from the ECI to the body uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. frame, so we need to invert it, uh, and obviously this is just inverting the space components. The vector one, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, Let me we, look at mine. Before, before you go away from that one, I just want to verify. Yes. I, have, I have the feeling that my... At some point I have the feeling that they were different, uh, but we change topic. Oh, no, my, my is MATLAB is so slow. <laughs> it's opening eventually. So you are changing sign to the first three and Yes, this was the only correction with, with respect to what we saw yesterday, this one, and then uh, by now we are not using uh, gamma double dot. We are neglecting it. Yeah, I think it's the same. It's just that I have it expressed in a different way, so I must have done something. Um, so mine is transpose of that. Uh, so it takes one, two, and three. Okay. All right. Okay. Keep going. Okay. So like this, it runs. And these are the plots that I obtain, I think. So these uh, are the plots for the quaternions. Uh, I had it run for 1.1 uh, times the uh, the period because I saw that something, um, that they were not perfectly aligned uh, when we reached the period. So maybe it's... Maria Grazia, sì? sorry, C can, you, can you go back to the plot of the quaternion? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah, because I had the same problem, but uh, I inverted the, um, the desired quaternion, not body quaternion. And because if you look at plot, uh, the um, quaternion components are, um, are different. For example, the yellow line of the desired quaternion and body quaternion are not the same. Ah, uh, you're right. Q3 and Q3, they should be both yellow. Actually, they're all, they're all flipped. Yes, they're flipped. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And um, I had the same problem on the definition of the error quaternion, but I inverted uh, the desired quaternion, not the quaternion which comes out from the integration of the ah. kinematics. Oh, why is that? I mean... I, I, I think uh, that... Uh, Besides the reordering of the codified components, you have to invert the, the quaternion, right? Because I think that you just reorder the, the components. Where? You mean in this function? No, no, no. no. And I think that um, the QB has to be QB and uh, the matrix uh, in which there are the components of the Q desired um, must contain the, the components of the inverse of the Q desired. Okay, but um, let me think. So QE is the one that goes from, so the, the um, DCM associated with QE should go from the ECI to the C reference frame. Uh, no. Do you agree? No. no. It should go from the space trap to the desired orientation. So from the space trap to LDH. It's, it's, uh, your, it's your current error, orientation. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, sorry, I'm talking about the desired quaternion, so the one oh, in this yes. matrix. Yes. Uh, so yes. it goes from uh, the, um, it goes from uh, L. Ah, so from LVLH to uh, ECI. I think that's how we did it, right? Yes. So maybe, yes, maybe you're right. 
we need to invert this one. So let me show you, and you know, I do not remember why I wrote it this way. It must have been on a piece of paper I simplified multiple times, and this is what I got. So if I stop I sharing. My screen, uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but I think it just overwrites. Okay. So this is what I see actually. And, and consider that there is a transpose at the end of this matrix. So this is how mine is looking like. And again, it may, yeah. just, it may just boil down to this because I manipulated things and, you know, and this is only the, the, the remember that we only use the first three, right, of the error quaternion. So I, I massaged the, the, the product matrix quaternion so that at the end I only have a three component vector and I, because I don't care about the last component. So yes, I think uh, this is the result of what uh, Alessia was uh, saying. Okay, so I mean you can you can I can if you want to make a test, uh, copy this. But again, it follows basically the slides that we have seen. It's just that you need to be careful about what what each quaternion is representing from where to where. Uh, yeah, yes, that was the problem. So, uh, just so I, so I put it in the chat. You can copy and paste, so you can share again. In the same function, you can try to copy and paste this, uh, but it does seem from the plots you showed me that it is working, except it is flipping them. If you look at the if if you look at the lines that you have, each line, if you change the sign of it, say to the the plot to the, on the right or the left, they will match actually. Yes, it's but in like fact, they go on, they then, go on top of each other. Yes, in fact, in the error quaternion, th then the error quaternion where I then inverted the body quaternion. Has uh, the correct plot is this okay. one is essentially it's zero. Uh, yeah. Trying to run my why is it not running now? See this? That is funny. And then also yes, for example, I also plotted the omega and they are they overlap. So seems like it's working. So you solved it. That's done. You don't need any help. Is that I, right? I, th I think it, it, yes, it's working. But now okay. uh, I'm not sure about the, the sign. So let me, let me show you what I see in my plots, which I showed you the first day. And um, and by the way, I did fix that. Uh, uh, remember that reorganization uh, after the function that converts from DCM to quaternion you guys uh, found for me. I did change that. Uh, doesn't seem to change the results really, but I don't know. Uh, it's running now, so as soon as it's done, I'll show you my plots. Which hopefully are still the same because I played with this. Uh, okay, so we are good with this assignment. As soon as I have my plots open. It's at 50%. I don't know why it's going so slow. Is it very slow for you as well? Yes, we uh, change yes. tolerance in order to make it faster. Absolutely. So maybe in the meantime, I can share again and we can uh, compare the matrices. So, um, I mean, it, I think it's the same that I have because if there you some, transpose this, yeah, maybe. yeah, but then when you transpose it, mm, not quite. I mean, I don't know. I um, thought so, but there are some differences, I think. Uh, I mean, if we only look at this first row, it should be the same as your first column, and uh, it is no apart from this sign. No, actually, it's not. Yeah, there are some differences. Okay, so you said that you have exactly the same. Um. No, I uh, actually changed a uh, little the, the code because now I am using the quaternion multiplication of the airspace block set. 
Uh-huh. To yes, compute the pattern. Uh, yes, because <laughs> because there were some issues here, and uh, uh, I need to invert the quaternion, and so to avoid uh, uh, do, doing something wrong, uh, I use so, the, the quaternion, the uh, space block. Okay, let's see if uh, in the end this is what you see, though. Uh, should I stop sharing? Yes. Okay. Uh, aside from me not putting legends, which is terrible, uh, I believe the red one is the desired quaternion over one orbit, and uh, the black one is uh, is the one that tracks it. And they're probably not as exactly identical at the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah I enough. also have the I also have the same results, but I think that is for the initial condition. Yeah, no, no, they don't. I don't want them to be identical. That's what I'm. I was, I was uh, pointing at that. There's actually some work done at the beginning, and then it's easy to stay on top because it's a slow motion. Yeah. Uh, if you start amending more difficult maneuvers, uh, things will be different. And this is the angular velocity error with the omega e, the difference between the two starts at some value, uh, then it goes quickly down to zero. We can zoom in. Um, oh yeah, there's some error at the beginning. And the fact that it resumes here is, uh, is basically, uh, I believe I start the orbit. I don't want to be mistaken. Maybe it's a perigee. Uh, and I believe that this is happening when the orbit speeds up again. And so, um, the angular velocity goes a little bit higher, and so you need to. I mean, we can run this for longer, and you will see that this will go and should do zero again. But it's it's pretty much. Yeah, uh, yes, it's what I did. Just uh, yeah, the, the runtime. I saw it to one point uh, one point one times the. Yeah, so see, yeah, I started a PDG. So basically, what's happening is that it adjusts, brings down the angular velocity. Then you know the angular velocity is actually getting smaller and smaller, then it speeds up and reaches the peak again here. And by peak, we're still talking about very tiny numbers, but um, I guess the controller has to catch up with that. And then I have the wheel angular rates. I don't know if this is what you see. And again, I don't have legends. That's on me. Sorry, I should. But these are the three reaction wheel. I mean, the part that accelerates the wheel. We start at 500, as you remember, and they, they do go up. Uh, the gimbal rates almost not used. So uh, one thing that one could try to do is change the gains that I gave you and make the CMG more important because it looks like the gimbals are not exploited and, and that's why the wheels are speeding up, which is not crazy, they're not speeding up too much, but I'm sure there is a way to reduce uh, the values that we see here and keep them lower and using the gimbals a little bit more. Because if you use the gimbal rates a little bit more, uh, you have that torque amplification term that is, uh, you know, that gamma dot, the multiplies omega of the wheel. So you, you're creating torque from that rather than just a uh, uh, big omega dot, which is accelerating the wheel. Uh, and then, so yeah, these, these plots are not that exciting unless you, you know, kind of zoom in. Uh, these are the wheels accelerations, very small. Um, and then angular velocity of the spacecraft, it should not actually go to zero, hopefully. Um, because, well, two components, yes, but one, it, this is the one, is the Z one, has to match the angular velocity of the orbit, right? And so, you see that one is never going to zero, and it, and it picks up again when you get close to the perigee, and it was, you know, it's symmetric, which makes perfect sense because it's the angular velocity of the orbit. Maximum of perigee uh, goes down to apogee here, and then it picks up again, so that makes sense. And so this is the angular velocity of the spacecraft that is trying to reproduce the one of the orbit, and I think that's it in terms of plots. Now. Um, one thing that, since you're so uh, ahead of the game with this, that you could try to implement is 
um, some physical limitations. First of all, you can change the maneuver. At this point, you have the code. You can you can demand more more from your. You can change the orbit. Uh, you can do whatever you want. So you can make it more demanding. Uh, but there is a couple of things that we're not coding now uh, that are important. Actually, I would say three uh, because we have variable speed control moment gyros. Uh, the the wheel rates cannot go to any number, so there must be a physical limitation to how quickly you can go. Uh, and, uh, and you know, there is a limit that is called saturation. Uh, so say that the wheels are given by the manufacturer and they cannot exceed 5,000 RPM. Uh, well, then that needs to be hard-coded so that they don't, some saturation of some sort. But the same is also true for the wheels accelerations because the accelerations of the wheels are given by an actual electrical motor somewhere, and that cannot uh, create an acceleration that is arbitrary. It will have a, a limit, and the same for the gimbal rates. They must be limited. Uh, this is an RPM as well. So, uh, one thing you could do is search for um, CMG's data online and, and put your own physical limitations if you want in the code um, and see if you can push the system to actually touch those those boundaries. Um, but that's that's something that you know in reality you will have to be avoid avoid that. And um, yeah, any questions on this assignment? It seems like everybody's doing pretty well, right? Okay. Uh, the gentleman who sent me the uh, gravity gradient code. Shall we look at that one? Yes, it was uh, it was me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. We uh, sh should I share it now or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We have time. Okay. Uh, okay. I just uh, open the file. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Um, okay. Uh, okay, as I, as I said to you, uh, I was trying to to see what happens if I start from um, initial conditions at, at, at the equilibrium point. So when the body uh, frame is uh, perfectly aligned with the, um, um, with, with the orbital frame, so I will come back to the MATLAB script. OK. Uh, here there is my inertia matrix. I try to stay in the in the in the um, in the region of stability uh, in the first. Uh, um, OK, <laughs> to say in English, in quadrant, the first quadrant. Uh -huh. Yes, and um, and I hope I'm, I'm stay good because yes, J two is greater than uh, J one, that in turn is greater than J three, so I'm in this condition, and uh, okay, I, here I have uh, I've given an initial condition in terms of uh, error error angles with respect to the orbital frame, so everything is zero, and then I converted into the uh, to the quaternion by exploiting this uh, built-in function angle to to quat, and um, also the initial initial angular velocity is uh, is zero. So okay, I try to. Before I forget, one quick yeah. comment. One thing we could try is also uh, if we want to be in a condition that is yeah I don't know but that's probably cheating. I was thinking whether. The initial angular velocity actually has to be the one of the orbit. But that's uh, it was the same thing of the high uh, But, but I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that that's fair. Right? And this is a circular orbit, right? Yeah, this is a circular orbit. And, uh, and if I can I see the initial conditions? Yes. You Again? see? The, the for the orbit. Ah right, sorry. I know that we discussed. Yes. Oh. Okay. 
So x y so ah so this is an orbit okay and has a velocity only on the y axis huh? hmm. okay it's an inclined orbit okay yeah. Uh, okay, so what is your initial what turning in? Okay, I can I can plot it. Uh, I can display it. Because now this is geometrically such that I cannot do what we were doing yesterday, you know. With the two rotations, maybe we can, but it's a little more elaborate to do by hands at least to visualize by hands. Okay, of course, obviously my quaternion is the the corresponding to the zero angles, but in my case, I have put the scalar value uh, in uh, as the first one because by using with the built-in blocks, I found out that the okay, of course, it treats uh, the scalar one as the first yeah, component. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's the quite, then going to uh, my Simulink uh, project. Yes. What is RB? What is RB? So that's the quaternion that represents what? Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, I'll stay for um, LVLH. Uh -huh. And so it, it represents the body frame with respect to the orbital frame. So LVLH. It's, uh, it's, class, it's the attitude of the spacecraft with respect to the orbital frame. And I start with initial condition uh, or the body frame aligned with this uh, orbital frame. And I, I, want, I want to j just to check if the output was uh, was was uh, diverging from the equilibrium because I should expect yeah, yeah, yeah. it not. But so, but the initial conditions for numerical integration of the quaternion of the spacecraft with respect to the inertial reference is not this one; it's something else. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, I I I got I go went to the block. Uh, to, sorry, to the simulink, and I converted these initial conditions here into uh, into the initial conditions needed for the Euler equation. So the orientation of body with respect to uh, uh, inertial. I don't know. I call it n, but I, don't, I should change. Well, but uh, and then I I use that initial condition into the Euler equations. So I, I I prefer just to define in the script in the initialization scripts the quantities with respect to LVLH, but probably I can, I can change and then only that's, it's no, useful. That's, that's fine, but I want to see how you do the rest then. How do you go from that to the initial? Uh, yes. Okay, I will open. Okay, I I just uh, exploited the, the block that that, that is also elsewhere in the um, symbolic project that simply converts. Uh, give the desired uh, attitude, but I applied to the initial conditions. So just uh, just this, and um, so th this part of the block is um, I can show you. I can show you. Is uh, here? Sorry. No, it's outside. Yes, is here. Is when we want we want to try to. To get the command attitude and the angular velocity. Yeah, yeah. So I took exactly the same block and I just used it for evaluate the initial uh, attitude. Uh, because in that block we um, okay. So the output here is uh, a, should be should be correct, but I don't know if there, there are some mistakes uh, here. And then there is also the doubt about the initial angular velocity. Because from the script, I have this input, which is the omega zero of the body with respect to the LVLH that I put zero, and I, I said, okay, it's the it's the um, angular velocity of the body with respect to inertia reference frame. Ah, okay. I just I just said this, but I don't know if uh, it's a correct. No. So so that's that. So you are you are actually. Uh, you are assume, so if you're saying that the initial angular velocity of the spacecraft with respect to LVLH is zero, that means you're moving like LVLH. And so your angular velocity 
of the spacecraft with respect to the inertia is the same as LVLH, which is not zero. Yeah, yeah, but uh, um, I, I, okay, probably it's it's a wrong notation I used, but if you see the, the this this uh, input four comes from my MATLAB script where the initial velocity is zero, and I just output this as the inertial angle, the angular velocity of the body with respect to inertia. So this one, which will actually enter in the earlier equation, is exactly zero. Yeah, so, it shouldn't be. Ah, it, should, it shouldn't Unless, be. The, the body with respect to inertia. It, well, it, it depends what you want. Do you want, do you want the spacecraft to be a zero angular velocity with respect to the inertia, or do you want the spacecraft to be a zero angular velocity with respect to LVLH? Uh, I want to stay in the equilibrium point, so it should be zero angular velocity with respect to LVLH. Then you have to, then, then the, the, so you can do it both ways. This way you're saying that it's actually, if that's the initial condition you use for the numerical integration of all these equations, then your spacecraft is, is, uh, uh, is not moving like LVLH. It actually has a, an angular velocity with respect to LVLH. Ah, OK, so, so right. if you want to do something else, the opposite, then you have to assign the spacecraft the same angular velocity of LVLH. OK, OK. Which is uh, uh, whatever the H vector is pointing, um, multiply times that square root of mu over, what is it, A cube? Mm. I don't remember. OK, so. Uh... I can, in this case, for instance, I, I also have the initial condition of LVLH with respect to inertia. I, I just uh, use this as a, as an initial conditions, in the sense that, um, okay, for instance, yeah, here, yeah. I can put uh, just in, in this way, because here as output, I, I have the LVLH with respect to inertia, but is no, is already is in um, N is the inertial in inertial components. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I should convert. Okay. Um, right. Yes. Okay. So matrix multiply. You also. This is a question that we had a few days ago whether the numerical integrators 1 over s, when they take external initial conditions, whether they take the first one only at the first time step, or they keep changing the initial condition. Because this omega now is going to change in time. The, so, the omega of the body with respect to the initial. Yes, and so okay. you are using it as initial condition, the first time step, but then is the numerical integrator forgetting, I mean, because it keeps getting this thing as an input. As initial condition input, and I don't know if that's how it's supposed to work. Remember, we couldn't find I couldn't find the answer last time. Um, basically, yeah, you have a block one over s that takes you can type in the initial condition in the in the window that opens when you double click, or you can select that the initial condition is external and it comes in from the signal. So if that signal is not coming from just a constant, but it's coming from a something that varies during the simulation, I don't know how the integrator block is behaving. That's what I'm asking, I guess. In other words, is it really using just the first time step value of that signal that comes in as initial condition, or is it doing something else? You don't know? Because that could be another major problem. Yeah, I think that you should be take uh, only the, the first values unless you set some uh, some reset options.
to be honest, given the small values of angular velocity, it shouldn't make a difference whether you start moving like LVLH or not. I don't think. But Is it running or you're still modifying things? It's, you're muted. I don't know if you can hear me. Ah, sorry, sorry. So I was no, speaking <laughs> this time. With, okay, sorry. Um, no, I'm trying to, to run, to run it, but um, I don't know why. It, it doesn't allow me to do it, even, even though I'm not modifying anything. And anything is running right now so okay let's check again mm. Okay, uh, I can try to <laughs> to close everything down and reopen. Oh, it's Probably. frozen. What? It's frozen. Yeah, it, it 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 doesn't allow me to to push to push the the run button. I, I don't know why. So I will try to brutally <laughs> close everything and then reopen. Mm, okay. Okay. But probably have more than one open. Okay. You didn't lose the the, mo the modifications. Mm -hmm. No, because I have saved. Uh, I think. But I uh, will check. Check if uh, the mod modification has not been destroyed. Okay. Okay. Okay, now uh, 
here I've plotted the um, quaternions. Okay, I have not plotted the error quaternions, but probably I, I should uh, because it's what a better the first, the first one is the quaternion of the uh, spacecraft body with respect to the LBLH, and oh. it's uh, uh, it should be good because it should stay. One is um, okay, probably it's not seen very well, but one, yeah, the scalar okay. component is one, and the other yeah. should be zero. I have also made an animation. <laughs> this is my last check. Nice. About uh, this, uh, I'll try to run. Like, well, this is too perfect now. It's just staying on top of it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, but I don't that's know if that's, it's because that's what I thought. That it's it's cheating in the sense that you you put your spacecraft exactly like LVLH is moving exactly like LVLH. Exactly. And uh, and I don't know if whether gravity gradient is really doing anything to keep it that way, or it's just that it's it just continues to move that way. Uh, Yes, it, that, that's uh, that's what I was thinking because uh, by putting. Uh, 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 okay, sorry. My, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah. the, the bikes uh, makes a lot of no <laughs> make a lot of noise. Sorry, um, the motorbikes uh, in the streets. Uh, uh, so um, no, I was just thinking that uh, as you said, if I if I put as initial condition the velo the, the angular velocity of the LVLH, I'm not uh, uh, enabling the gravity gradient to act. As a stabilizing uh, force. Yeah. Well, let's see what it is now. Let's see what it does. Okay. Do I, will, I will. Uh, <laughs> I will. Run. Good. The, anim the animation, right? You were talking. Yeah. About yeah. It. I was. I was running the animation. But, okay. I don't know if you see. Nice. Oh yeah. So it's super perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, I've already checked the animation without uh, using the gravity gradient, and uh, it 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 it, do, it it does what I should expect. Okay, so so and so instead, if you go back to what you had before and you put zero zero zero, what does it do? Yes, it's very unstable, or it's very very unstable. I will I can show you. Interesting. Uh, okay, I will I will put again. Uh, okay, now I need to to modify uh, some something. Okay. Actually, my initial conditions are uh, all, uh, all zero. So also the angular velocity now is zero. I now I run the simulink. Okay. I first plot the quaternions. And uh, you see, I, I, I see this behavior. And well, it's, it's trying to stabilize, no? What is it? No. Uh, yes, but it, it probably, uh, in order to visualize this in animation, I should run more than one orbit period. If, if it is like this, so I, I can try. I can go to simulate. It's, it's going to a specific angle. Yeah. I, I will run three orbit uh, periods. And yes, there's a stable, uh, you know, a stable state. I have, and this is me just, you know, shooting in the dark here. But I'm wondering whether the distribution of moments of inertia is correct 
because um, see you you have the first moment of inertia x the second and the second is the highest correct yes so but we've been playing with x y and z now we're going to point the z down the way you, you're setting up the initial conditions you're going to point the body of the z down because that's a3 correct uh yes yes because the a3 is the minimum uh one so you're going to put the maximum one along the angular momentum exactly and the X is along the A1, which is the roll direction. Hmm. Yes. But it's, it's stabilizing. What are the other angles again? The other angles are uh, all uh, at the initial. End. No, at the at end. The it, end. Stabilizes, it stabilizes in which position? Yes, I will. I have. Okay, the, the plot of the other angles is a very, it's like this. Uh, no, but I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just jumping. It's the same value. Yeah, mind. I will try to. What do you oh. uh, let's see. Uh, and let me check. Uh, Okay, these are the other single. Uh, what what sequence is this? Is it a three to one? Yes, the yeah. the first one is phi, and the last is uh, is psi. Yeah, but the second one is ninety, which is the singular case. So, yes, mm, not very useful. Because you, you're basically saying that the first and last can be anything as long as the difference is the same. And in fact, I think they're canceling each other. So I'm thinking what's happening here. Hmm. Okay, it's a three, two, one, right? So X, Y, Z, uh, either 180, either 19 or another 180. It's it's flipping in some way. Yes, but it, it looks like that the the gravity gradient is uh, destabilizing in the sense that well, it, uh, it moves to another completely point of uh, equilibrium. Stabilizing with respect to another orientation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I'm trying to understand what that orientation is. Mm. So let's think about this. Assuming that we want to accept this sequence. I'm going to use my overhead camera if you stop sharing for a second, right? So you have the other angles that are psi is 180, theta is 90, and phi is 180. And it's a 3, 2, 1 sequence. Yes. And so if I start from the x, y, and z, and this would be the LDLH basically, um, the first rotation goes all the way here with the x axis. So I have an x prime here and a y prime that is here. And then, so why is pointing that way? There, I do a 90 degree, 90 degree positive. Is that way, right? So my x goes down here 
and my z goes here. And then, and then you do another 180 about this one. And so, gosh. Um, yeah, it, to me, it looks like your spacecraft it will point with the the final orientation will be with a Z of the spacecraft pointing like this, the X of the spacecraft pointing like this, and uh, the Y like this. Is that right? Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah, I can I can try to run the animation and see you what uh, what happens at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I share again my screen if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, starting from um, okay, you see that starting from initial conditions aligned to LVLH, it it, it really uh, diverges, and okay, probably is uh, is uh, very slow, uh, but after one orbit. Uh, we should uh, see uh, the final uh, equilibrium. Yeah. Yep. Have you tried to increase the second moment of inertia even more? Uh, I I tried. I made some trial, but uh, I don't know if. Uh, if I if I was forcing uh, some something, but I, I can try I can try again and see see what happens. I can stop and uh, and put a huge value of, <laughs> of the inertial momentum. It must be it must be something small that is that some mistake that is not. Yeah, just start the zero just for fun. See what happens. Zero. No no no. Yeah, no, make it bigger, make it 1500. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's just, yeah. just for fun. Okay. Yeah, see what happens. So now you're not starting with the same angular velocity. No, I'm starting with zero uh, angular velocity with respect to the inertial frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also need to keep in mind one thing that the analysis we have done is for small angles. Yeah. Um, yeah, look at that. Interesting. <laughs> Can I look yes. at the other angles? Yes. Oh, my goodness. No, I mean, you had the plots there. It's definitely not, uh, not the best. Yeah. Yeah, the plot. Uh, okay, no, I should. Uh, I should change a little bit. Uh, okay, but in the meantime, I will run the final order angle. But uh, it's not. It's not stable. Uh, there's. There's not. There's not a final configuration like in the first. The first one. Okay, I will. I will first. Okay, no, let's plot better the other angles. Well, you know, if you if you increase that second one, the difference between that one and the other ones, it should become more stable, actually, right? The sorry, I didn't understood what what difference. I think, I think if you make the second moment of inertia, unless I'm, I'm I'm moving to some other regions of the kx kz plane, but yeah. I'm wondering, you sh it should make it more stable, right? Yeah, yeah, because I'm I'm at, I'm always in the first. Uh, Right, left region of the um, of the Cartesian uh, graph. So I, I'm in uh, I'm in the stable configuration. So even increasing J two, I should I should get a really more stable uh, value, a uh, more stable situation. Has anyone else worked on this gravity gradient? means no. 
Uh, yes, but uh, it works only for the ideal initial values. Like like what he did before. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, but then in that case it's perfect. There's not even any oscillation. Uh, no, no. It, you are able to track perfectly the the orbital uh, reference frame. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether we can find the error or if there is any, and if there isn't, whether we need, uh, yeah, if we're not staying in the linearization region. The other thing you could try is uh, take uh, the previous case where it was perfectly aligned, you have the angular velocities that are exactly the same with respect to ECI, but take uh, the spacecraft angular velocity and change it a little bit to be, you know, 90% of what it should be. Okay. Just to be a little bit away from the initial condition. I'm sorry. It's just this is yeah. my way to avoid going inside the code and try to do bad things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you change the initial conditions. Okay. So. Uh... No, no. So this is what you had before. Uh, yeah, you just uh, multiply times a point nine. Yes. Put back the matrix multiply basically. But then change the angular velocity a tiny bit. Yes, I can put again. Uh, I, I can change the all all the components of the angular velocity. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's put 0.9. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, it, it seems better. I don't know. The other angles? Oh. What is that thing doing? That's the second angle. Yes, the pitch the pitch is completely un unstable. The pitch is unstable. How is it doing that? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, go back to your original moment of inertia, 150, maybe. So, but I think, I don't, again, you may have some error somewhere, but I think it's yeah, a matter. Yeah, it works. I'm sorry? It works uh, by modifying a little bit the initial angular velocity. Oh, you have a, you have a different result? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we can take a look at this one and then you share your screen, maybe? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you share. Uh, not. Dario, <laughs> I think that, uh, okay, but I can share now. Ah, uh, sorry, it was, uh, was, uh, no? I didn't understand. It was mine. I, I stopped, I stopped sharing, stop sharing to allow you to share. That is perfectly fine. Okay. So, I think that you can now can see my screen. Yes. Uh, yeah, these are the um, the first angle, but these are the other angles of the body with respect to the inertial frame. So okay. I think that. It is. Yeah. Per, it makes perfectly sense that yeah, uh, it has to go around uh, every orbit. It has to go around one time. Yep. Yeah. And these are the quaternion and the desired quaternion. Okay. 
and the side for them. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, you don't have you don't have the other angles with respect to uh, the edge. Uh, no. But you well, but you have the side. You can. So, so that's the quaternion to the right is the quaternion of LBLH with respect to inertial, and to the left is the quaternion of the spacecraft with respect to inertial. Um, to the to the left is the quaternion of the spacecraft with respect to inertial, but to the right is the quaternion of the LBLH with respect to the inertial. So yeah, you can see that they are pretty much identical. I would still like to see some oscillation. Um, can you plot them uh, in the same plot? So they shouldn't be exact. Yes. In fact, they're not identical. They're not identical, right? No, no, they are not identical. Uh, I think that uh, we can see at the end of plot that there are some differences. Do you have the quaternion uh, error somewhere? Uh, no, but uh, I don't know if I can plot it easily. OK, that's fine. But it seems, I mean, it, from these plots, it makes sense. It would be nice to see the other angles as well. Uh, yeah, but okay. I mean, the other angles of the uh, uh, body with respect to the LH. Good. So, yeah, it could be, you know, aside from having some errors in the code or, you know, not transposing a matrix and all that pain with the rotation matrices, which are not really uh, the thing that I love the most. <laughs> uh, but uh, it could be, I mean, be careful because the analysis is good when, when you are pretty close to that motion. And, uh, and Probably, if you start your spacecraft completely at rest while LH is moving, even though it's moving slowly, that's fast enough to not be linear anymore. It's possible that the analysis doesn't apply. Um, but it's interesting that it's stabilizing in a new configuration, which is, you know, possibly true. Uh, okay. yes. uh, sorry, Alessia, did, did you try to uh, to start from initial conditions li like I did? So align? Uh, no, I have the initial values defined uh, in the initialized uh, script, initialized script here. Okay. So for the spacecraft, you have what? So uh, the ideal orientation, so uh, it means that uh, at initial time, the body is aligned with the orbital frame and uh, omega is the 90% of the ideal uh, initial, okay. the orbital angular velocity. Oh, but see, but see she, she is doing the point, the 90% before the matrix multiply. That's also what's happening. Because this is in the... This is the omega angular velocity expressed in the LBLH frame. Right. So uh, Mr. Pisanti, maybe you can try to do that. Put that yeah, point yeah. line before the matrix multiplier, because I think that's what's so so. Because you you first you transform it into uh, into inertia, and in that case you have three components. Um, so yeah, that could be a difference. Yes. Okay, I can. I can what try. moments of inertia do you have, uh, Alessia? What, what do you have? Moments of inertia? Um, oh, the ones I, think, okay. I okay. think that are the same. Yeah. That's great. Can you all, uh, for, so for those who have also added gravity gradient, if you can send me that code as well, that would be great. I mean, you don't okay. have to. Yeah. You don't have to, but if you do, I'll recycle it for another class. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we survive. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Even though I have to say that using someone else's software is 90% of the, of the time is impossible and painful. Unless they're very good at simplifying things and commenting. I had a PhD student, the one who worked on the re-entry problem, is 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 very smart, uh, but trying to understand his MATLAB code is uh, it's impossible. Anyways, uh, so do you want to uh, go back and share Dario's screen? Maybe? Yeah. Yes. Share. Uh, yes. I'm I'm not sharing, right? No, no. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, make the change. Uh, the ninety. Oh, you did already. 
Yeah, I put, uh, I did it. And that's what I get in uh, Quaternion. Okay. Uh, oh, this is um, bo um, spacecraft with respect to LVLH. Uh -huh. And uh, let's see the Euler's angular, uh, Euler's angular, this one. So for me, it's not, uh, it's not stable in the pitch. Mm. But in Alessia, Alessia, you you found you found out that it was stable in in the pitch. Well, um, uh, she doesn't have this plot. Maybe if she can work on this plot, we can make a comparison. She has ah, the, okay, okay, sorry, I didn't understood. She has the quaternion plots. I'm wondering if this thing is an artifact of something because it's jumping between ninety and minus ninety. Uh, so. I wonder if this is true. Probably yes, because the uh, okay, the, the the quaternion should be qu quite stable. So I don't know if it is it explains why I have this jump between zero and ninety degree. But how, I, do, you, I don't how do you extract the Euler angle? Yes, the quaternion, the relative quaternion. Uh, uh, okay, let's let's see. Uh, so no, I, I okay. I, I just uh, put as output from the um, simulink. I will check uh, simulink. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no, outside. Uh, no, yes, I just uh, I just use the um, mm. the built-in function. Yeah. And uh, and I converted in degree and then. Uh, yeah. I don't know about those functions. I never use them. Um, can you double click on that function? I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but it's just that we don't know exactly what it's doing. So it's, you're doing the Z, Y, X. Yes. Z, Y, X. Yeah. And the L1 should be uh, Psi. Yeah. And, uh, Okay, even if, if even if R1 and R3 are uh, not the correct one, the R2 should be theta for, for sure, and uh, I have, and so I have uh, instability in, in pitch, so, so. Well, um, hold on a second. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let me see, this is just for fun. I'm going to send you uh my function that spits out the quaternion uh the order angle from quaternions okay it is actually part of your assignment homework one but just to put in a matlab function that it's exactly that and substitute that blocks you have the block you have yes. that's the only place where you use uh this conversion right or no you use it somewhere else as well uh no but uh really really it does not i don't use yeah the, the other place where i use it it's just for okay visualization okay fine. visualization but here i don't know yeah. probably i use it in as initial condition i should uh, should check in yeah no no okay, okay. so uh Okay, uh, equal two should be uh, theta, right? One. Okay, let's, let's see. Um, yeah. Probably there's. Uh, okay, I just pay, paste it from the chat, but probably there's. Uh, ah, yes, a comment here. I just remove that. Yeah. And uh, yes. Um, ah, in my what enters in this function as a uh, as scalar component k one. Uh, I don't know if your code 
uh, e, use, use, use the scalar component are the scalar component of the quaternion as the, the first uh, element. Yes, so you need to switch at the beginning. Yes. Ah, OK, OK. Yes, sorry. No, no. So your your could actually use the um, the fourth as a scalar component. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. This aku okay should not be. Okay. So. No, okay, and let no, 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 but in, in the, okay. Um, here I I put uh. As the the first uh, the first component of Euler Euler vector uh, psi, I don't know if it is correct. Uh, if I if I check on your code, uh, okay, I'm not I'm not able to, un to understand if uh, the first Euler angle is phi or psi, but it should be phi, um, right? Yeah, I need to go back to the actual BCM. I think uh, I think it's phi. First one, so the one with the one uh, with the one eaq one is phi. And then okay. two is stay down and three is psi, I think. Yeah. Mm. So let's try this. Whatever happens, we're gonna take a break, five minutes, and then we'll be back. Okay. Uh, uh. What? It doesn't like it. <laughs> Let's see. Why not? First assignment determines this class. Oh, uh, ah, can, you go inside, a... can you go inside the code? Yes, there's. Yeah, you removed. I had an assignment that initializes the EAQ uh, right. uh, zero, zero, zero. Right, right, sorry. For some reason, it wants that. Okay. Okay. Everything fine. Mm. These are quaternion, and uh, yes, it's, uh, it's the same. Yeah, um, we need to think about it, but I need to take a break. Yeah. Let's resume at 25, okay? 25 minutes. Okay. See you later.